I'm reading from uh, the book of Romans, chapter 3 and verse 23. Very well known scripture, we all know it off by heart and can quote it. Chapter and verse, it says this, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, this word sin causes a lot of problems to so many people. Uh, in fact, I get emails from people saying, uh, how, there are so many good people out there, John. How can we say that they have sinned or that they are uh, sinners? When we think of people like Mother Teresa, for example, <laughs> we don't immediately think of Mother Teresa as being a, a sinner. Uh, in that lady, we have seen more saintliness than anything else. And you know, we can all think of someone that we would find difficult to think of as being a sinner, some kind of saintly person. I thought of my mother like that. Uh, we, we all know someone that we would find very difficult to say that person is a sinner. And the reason for this is because we normally equate sin with bad actions, such as murder, rape, paedophilia, and so on and so forth. That's how we think of someone as being sinful. And because many people, and that includes you and that includes me, don't do those kind of offences, then we would think, well, how can I be a sinner? I live a good life. So therefore, how can I be a sinner? And how dare anybody call me a sinner? Well, first of all, and this is what I want to do uh, today, I, I want to try and introduce uh, the root meaning of this word sin to explain to each and every one of us what this word sin means. It's not as difficult as, as, as we think it might be. The Greek word for sin is harmatia. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation. I'm better off with Spanish than I am with Greek. But harmatia is the Greek word for sin. Harmatia originally was a term used by archers. You know those guys with a bow and arrow and they pull back and they shoot the arrow and into a kind of a target and they are aiming for the bullseye. In English we call it the bullseye. I don't know what other people call it. But that's what he's after getting. He wants to shoot that arrow and get it straight into the bullseye. He may get the bullseye or more than likely he will miss the bullseye. He may miss it by a thousandth of a centimetre, whatever that may be, or he may miss by a, a kilometre. Uh, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether he's missed by that much or that much. He's missed. The distance of the miss really does not matter at all. It's the missing that really counts. You see, you don't get a gold med medal in the Olympics for missing. It's that simple. No matter how good you are, no matter how nice a person you are, you will not get a, a gold medal for missing. It's that simple. Another example is it's like saying that a man is standing at a bus stop and he's waiting for the bus. And then someone comes by and they say, what are you waiting for? And he says, well, I'm waiting for the bus. And the person says, oh, you've missed it. There's no more today. If that was the last bus. You've missed the bus. Now, it doesn't matter whether that man has missed the bus by five minutes or five hours. Really doesn't matter. He's missed the bus. The length of time of missing the bus really doesn't come into it. It, it really doesn't matter. The man is not on the bus. Now, this is what Paul is talking about in Romans 3.23. He says, we all fall short of God's glory. My paraphrase of this uh, verse could be this. We all have sinned, hamartia, missed, missed the bullseye, because we do not measure up to God's standard of perfection. We might be good. But God is holy and righteous. And I don't know many sane people 
that would ever claim to be holy and righteous. So we miss the mark of God's holiness and righteousness. It doesn't matter if I miss the mark because of one small fault in my life or for several big faults, it really doesn't matter, I've missed. The gravity of the missing is not important. What is important is the fact that we miss, just like missing the bullseye. We don't get it, we don't get the gold medal. Or the man missing the bus, doesn't matter by how long he missed the bus, he's not going to be on that bus. So the time or the distance or the gravity of missing really doesn't matter. It's the missing that counts. And so the Bible tells us that God sent his son into the world to fulfill a legal obligation. And that obligation is that according to God's righteous law, which says the soul that sins shall surely die. And so Christ came to fulfill that legal obligation in our place. He came to die a vicarious death. And the scripture now says after he uh, died that vicarious death, it says, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? See, the word vicarious simply means taking the place of another person, acting or serving as a substitute. And that's what Christ did for us on the cross. He acted as a substitute. So he took the punishment for our sin, vicariously. So although eventually we will die one day, physically we will die, that death will not be fatal. We will not, uh, that death will not destroy us because after death, God will raise us again from the dead because of the vicarious death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. And you know, there's only one condition attached to this, just one condition. And that is that we believe upon Christ and that we follow Christ in our lives. Well, there are many people, of course, who scorn all this and they say, no, no, it, it, this is way too simplistic. It can't be this easy. Uh, and their intellect becomes offended as a result of the, the simplicity of all this. But I want to say something to you at this point. To be an unbeliever, or we may say an atheist, to be an atheist is not an intellectual problem really, but it's a moral problem. In other words, being intellectual doesn't bar us from becoming Christians. We all know many great intellectuals that have become Christians uh, down throughout history. The problem with the atheist is that they do not want to admit that they may well be a God. They don't want to admit that. Because if they do, then they must become accountable to that God. And at no price do they want this. And this is the state that we call rebellion. They do not want God in their lives. They do not want to be accountable to God in their lives. No, at no price do they want this. And so, some people will make any excuse why it is impossible for them to believe. Usually, how they do this is by accusing God of being unfair, unjust, monstrous. You know, <laughs> the, best, the best method of defence is always attack. And so in order to try and set up a defence against God, we attack God and accuse him of all kinds of things that is monstrous. But people who do this don't take one thing into account, one very, very important thing, that one day we're going to have to stand in front of Christ and we're going to have to repeat our accusations to his face. And that's a fact of life. Okay then, so the sin I'm talking about is a condition. We're, we're born with this condition of, of uh, falling short of, of God's glory, not being as perfect as he is, not being as holy and as righteous as he is. And we inherit this condition when we are born. And that's why Jesus had to be born of a virgin and had to be born of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, 
he himself would have inherited a sinful nature. But even though sin is a condition, it can of course become an action. If it isn't checked, it can lead on to great evil. We've all seen some of the evil uh, in our world today and in the history of the world. Of course we can think about Adolf Hitler, he's a very good example of someone who does not check his sinful nature and goes on to commit atrocities. Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Gaddafi and, and so many people uh, and of course there are many more than these. these, these are just four of so many. These are men that within our lifetime have committed great atrocities even though there were many more, but we have seen these men, so I'm not referring to those in the past that we have not seen. But I, what I want to do right now is to bring sinful action, we've been discussing the sinful condition, but now I want to bring sinful action down to its very lowest level, down to my level, down to your level, and down to your level too. You see, because Many of us have never committed atrocities, we've never done some of these terrible, wicked things. So we may find it difficult to see ourselves as sinners. But I want to ask a question, I'm going to ask uh, you to raise your hand if this applies to you. How many of us have ever told a lie, even a little white lie to someone? Hands up if we have done that. Oh yeah, I can see that <laughs> we've got a lot of sinners here today. <laughs> we've all done that, haven't we? We've all told a, a little fib at some time, a little lie. But what does that make us? It makes us liars, doesn't it? How many of us have tamed something that doesn't belong to us, even if it was just a little paper clip from the office of work or whatever? How many of us have taken something, raise your right arm, if you've tamed something, that didn't belong to you. It may not have uh, affected other people by the taking, it may not have uh, cost anyone anything, but we took it because it was there to take. How many of us? Oh yes, I can see that uh, many of us are sinners. <laughs> but what does that make us if we've taken something that doesn't belong to us? It actually makes us thieves, doesn't it? How many of us have taken the Lord's name in vain at some time? in our lives, in the past. If we don't do it now, we've done it in the past. We've said, oh, JC, how many of us have done something like that? Mm. What does that make us? It makes us blasphemous, doesn't it? Now, actually, I've only mentioned three of the commandments. And already, most of us here have been guilty of breaking one of those commandments. That makes us guilty of being imperfect or falling short of God's perfection, or in other words, sinful. Well, that's only three of the commandments. We could go on and on. So, right here today, not one of us can actually claim never to have sinned in our lives. You see, God is perfect holy and righteous. So how can we, who are not perfect, holy and righteous, ever stand before him with a clear conscience? We cannot do it unless, unless our sin and our sinful condition and sinful uh, actions, no matter how small, unless they are dealt with first, how can we stand before God? with a clean conscience. I want to propose this morning that we cannot do that. The book of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says this, When Christ had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honour at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. When Christ had cleansed us from our sins, then he sat down at the majestic right hand of the God in heaven. Christ has cleansed us from our sin. Therefore, now because of him, because of Christ, because of what he did upon Calvary's tree, we can stand in the presence of Almighty God. Not because we are perfect, not because we are holy and righteous in ourselves, but because of what he did, because of his vicarious death, 
we can stand in the presence of Almighty God with a clean and clear conscience. Now some people will poo-poo all this and we can poo-poo it all we want but that will not alter the reality of the situation. Our unbelief does not make what he did unreal. Someone once said to me, not too long ago, a few months ago, uh, you know, John, I, I would like to be a Christian, but how can I love a God who wants to send me to hell? And I replied to that answer, and I said, God doesn't want to send you to hell. We travel there under our own steam. God doesn't want to send you there. But if God has set up this rescue plan, this plan to keep us away from hell, if we totally reject that, then we send ourselves to hell. God doesn't send us to hell. You know, if, we, if we're driving down the road and we suddenly see a sign that says, Danger ahead! Then that sign is trying to warn us and trying to save us from some incident that may well be down the road further ahead. That sign is not trying to endanger us. The sign is acting as a warning. And it's the same thing with the Gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not trying to endanger us, it's trying to warn us, trying to help us to avoid what is coming later on. It is us that refuses to listen or to take any notice of it. If I refuse to observe that sign that says danger, uh, danger ahead, then I, I, I could just drive that car hurtling to whatever is in front. If I do not observe that sign and take notice of it and do something about it. And so it is with God. God is, gives us the sign, the warning signs. He is not trying to endanger us. He's trying to rescue us from that danger. Christ is God's way for us to survive death and whatever may come after death. And you know, it's pretty dumb to shake your fist at such a God who is trying to warn us and to help us and trying to rescue us and trying to save us. It's pretty dumb to shake your fist and to say all kinds of things, all kinds of accusations against him. So of course another question that arises from all this is, well, what kind of God is it that makes up all these kinds of rules? Rules, for example, which I've already mentioned that says, the soul that sins, it shall surely die. What kind of God is, is it that makes up a rule like that? Rules which demand that if we do disobey and if we do break the rule uh, and, and put ourselves in danger, that someone else, like Jesus, has to come and uh, die in our place, to be a substitute, to take our punishment for us. What kind of God is it that makes up these kinds of rules? Surely he is a God who makes things impossible. Well, folks, you know, we need to understand that God's ways are not our ways. His ways are far higher than our ways. I was at a political meeting uh, only last week with Ron over there. And we had a speaker from uh, Parliament and he was very, very informative and very humorous with it. He was a great guy to listen to. One of the statements he made was this. It has always been understood that a politician will lie for his country. <laughs> There's a strange statement, but it's actually a true statement. He said, it's always been understood that a politician will lie for his country. And then he went on to say, but now, now we have a breed of politicians that are lying to their country and lying against their country. And this is something new on the political scene. Just before we started the meeting, I had a one-to-one -one talk with him and I asked him, this is the question I asked him, do you think we'll ever see any men of integrity, any men of honesty in, in our parliament in, in Westminster ever again? And a strange reply, I didn't quite expect this. I expected him to say, oh no, he never will. But this is what he said. He said, John, there are many men of integrity at Westminster right now. 
but they are all on the back benches. They are not allowed into the government because the government don't want honest men. They don't want men of integrity because these people just cause trouble for the government and so they're not allowed in the government anymore, only on the back benches. You know, when we think about it, how many scandals have we seen recently? The corruption within FIFA, the Football Association, corruption of a, a Member of Parliament's expenses. Now, currently, we've got this big scandal of the phone hacking, and we don't know how far this goes back. Did it go back to 9-11, uh, in fact, uh, the FBI are now asking? And we found out that the police have been selling journalists information just to line their own pockets. As we read the news, watch the news on the television, children are being brutalised and murdered while social services do nothing about it. Children are being kidnapped, we've had recent cases of this, by paedophiles, whilst inept policemen do very little about it. This is the kind of society, just read your papers. I heard uh, a man uh, giving a strong discourse against why he does not believe in God. And in this, one of the accusations he made against God was that millions of children die and God does nothing to prevent this. What he didn't mention, what he didn't mention, was that 53 million babies were killed by abortion in the United States. 53 million babies have been killed by abortion in the United States. And so it goes on and on and on, and it's not getting any better, it's certainly getting much worse. Just read your newspapers. Watch the news on the television. It's all sickening. You don't read any good news anymore. It's all bad news, bad news, probably because there isn't any good news uh, to be reported. And I don't know about you, but it makes me sick in my stomach every time I read it or see it on the television. So we dare, we dare to ask God why he is so honest. Why he makes rules that cannot be broken. We dare to ask him this, to challenge him. And why does he hold men to account for their dishonesties and for the horror and so on and so on. And then he allows his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to come and to be slaughtered by man in order to rescue us and we dare to question him we dare to question him or even shake the fist at him you know in our frail and imperfect legal system and ours here in england is, has been one of the best in the world and many nations throughout the world have copied our legal system and yet at best it's very frail and it's very imperfect but in this frail and imperfect legal system, we demand evidence of a man's guilt. And you know, when all the evidence of man's guilt is amassed from down throughout history till now, until the end of the age, when all this evidence is collected, there will only be one verdict against man. Guilty. 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 Because not one of us not one of us, even the best amongst you, not one of you, not one of us can say that we have never done anything wrong in our lives. Only the biggest fool and hypocrite can say, I have be behaved impeccably in all things, in, in all details of my life. Only a fool and hypocrite can ever claim that. So, according to the law, we have sinned, we have fallen short. Whether it was a little sin or whether it was a gigantic sin, we have all sinned. You know, man's law, that's our law, would not compromise with an offender. There is no compromise with an offender. If, they, if the evidence shows that they have done the deed, then they will be punished for that deed, whether it be prison or something else. Why is it then that we don't accept that God's law 
will never compromise with an offender. God's law will never compromise with an offender and they will be justly punished. And yet, for all of this, God offers us a way out. What does he say to us? What is he saying to us right now? Come to me, repent. Repent means to kind of, I suppose, apologise and then turn away. Stop doing it. Apologise and stop doing it. Uh, someone once told me that the meaning of the word repent is that you're going in one direction, you turn around and you go in a different direction. Come to me, repent, and accept my son, my son who died upon that cross to make this possible. And this is what God says to us, and you will walk out of court a free man. You will walk out of court a free woman. That is the offer that God gives to us. Now, if any man, and with this I close, if any man, after all this, wants to shake his fist at God, then all I can say is, he deserves his fate. Amen. God bless you all.